it. The opening gap is uh, going to be occurring here in the New York Stock Exchange uh, with the New York Stock Exchange open in about 15 minutes. And I want to get everyone on the same uh, proverbial sheet of music, if you will, regarding uh, my terminology and exactly what a gap is and uh, how I um, measure them and study them. So uh, I'm going to do a brief introduction into gaps. Uh, then we'll go right into live trading of the gap, and I'll describe sort of play by play what I'm looking at and what's happening. And then I'm going to back up and uh, help people understand the mechanics of the opening gap and uh, exactly what I'm looking for each day and uh, what ultimately drives my decision to trade an opening gap or not. I do welcome questions. Uh, feel free to type them in the chat box there. I will make a judgment call on if they're related to the topic or slide that I'm on at the moment. Uh, so I may pass on your question, but I always answer all my questions. So uh, feel free to uh, uh, refer back or reference back to, a, uh, I guess, the timestamp when you submit your message or just resubmit it if I miss it somehow. Okay. Um, and uh, let's see. Obligatory disclaimer here. Uh, I am a futures trader primarily. The principles I'm going to be sharing and, and the concepts uh, and research will be focused on the S&P futures. However, they are universal in that the general concepts work on stocks, um, ETFs, uh, commodities, other indices. I've tested the DAX and the FTSE and uh, a number of markets around the world, and the principles are all the same. So what I'll teach you, and that's going to be based on the S&P, is applicable to other markets. Now that said, um, even uh, this data um, may not represent what will happen in the future. We can make no guarantees on that. But as I like to uh, say, history um, is not a perfect guide, but it's the best guide that we as active traders and for that matter institutions and money managers have. So um, we're trying to avoid prior mistakes and use uh, historical analysis to uh, steer us in the right direction uh, each given day. So please do use this information uh, at your own risk. I'm going to be um, showing my actual live trades on my screens. I highly recommend you not trade them uh, today. You're welcome to. I have no idea if they're going to make money today or not. I never do. And quite frankly, I really don't care, and I don't mean to say that in a way that um, comes across as I'm not serious at all, but really this is a long-term game. Uh, I've got very long-term, well-vetted out, well-thought-out, well-studied strategies I've traded for many years. Um, in fact, I'm probably around 3,000 opening gap trades I've analyzed and, tra and considered trading each day over the past decade plus. So um, please just try to focus on learning the concepts today, and uh, you'll get to see whether or not I make money or not. I think I've got one trade that is uh, setting up, but we'll get to that in a moment. So here's the exact agenda. I'm going to show you um, the only thing that matters on my resume. Um, uh, Dan uh, discussed a little bit about it, but there's really only one thing that matters, and I'll talk a little bit about what matters on your resume as well. I'm going to help you understand the basics of fading the gap, and then I'm going to demonstrate my gap rules with live trading. So this next two bullets, this first two items there, I'm going to cover in the next 10 minutes. Uh, then we'll get into live trading, and then I'm going to come back to my research and break down the logic and how I break down the opening gaps and um, answer any and all of your questions, tell you how you can learn a little bit more about us at Investaquan if you're interested. Uh, I do have a webinar next Thursday. Uh, that will be sort of a behind-the-scenes look, if you will, at InvestorQuant. But today's not a commercial, so I'm going to warn you right now. Uh, I am going to show uh, some of my tools. I will not be uh, able to answer all your questions regarding our website. In fact, I don't even want to get into them. I just want to focus on the research um, and connect the dots. Uh, I am not like a lot of educators and people in this industry that go for the hard close. The first time you hear me with some offer and trying to get you to part with some money, that's not happening today. So relax, put your feet back. Let's have a conversation about opening gaps. I do see a question already about um, a copy of the slides. So uh, there's the URL if you would like a copy of these slides. Go to www.investaquant.com forward slash winvesting. 
Uh, that's also where you can um, instantly download my ebook, which is about 50 pages. And quite frankly, um, I know I'm going to confuse some of you just the nature of trading. There's a wide range of experiences here in the trading room, and uh, some of you will track perfectly with me. Some of you won't even be able to understand my southern uh, slang. I apologize for that. Uh, so uh, definitely download my ebook at investorquant.com forward slash winvesting along with the slides and the book will explain these key concepts and a whole lot more to you. Um, and what I like to think of is plain English. So here's why you might want to listen to me over the next hour or so. Dan mentioned a lot of this. Pretty impressive, right? It doesn't matter. Okay, it's it's all quite frankly um, not a reason to listen to me. Um, the, plenty of smart people in this world. In fact, I've worked with hundreds of very smart people, uh, PhDs, doctors, lawyers, engineers, construction, you name it. Um, and the one common trait I have found is that the successful traders are all very tenacious. But they're not always the smartest guys. They're not the guys with the highest IQs. They're not the guys with the greatest resumes or the most impressive ed educational credentials. They're just not. Uh, I think sometimes um, too much raw intelligence impedes with one's ability to follow a simple plan. You tend to overthink. So everything I've done in my life prior to being a trader, um, it's nice. It's interesting. I've got some cool stories if you ever want to hear them. But that is not why you're here to listen to me. It is not a reason you should listen to me by any means. Now this is a step in the right direction. It's my uh, live trading results for the opening gap in January. That's January of this year. On the left, it's organized by date. So you can see down here below January 5th, I think it was the first trading day, all the way through uh, uh, the end of the month ran up, took off just a tremendous run. I think it may have been my best opening two weeks ever um, uh, of trading for a given year. And then we've just pulled back a little bit, had a number of wins, some losses. And this on the far right is by trade. And uh, that just organizes by trade versus on close by date, two slightly different um, views of the exact same data. But even that, it's not enough. Who cares that I made money in January, honestly? Is that a reason for you to listen to me? I mean, the truth of the matter is uh, it's 50-50 with just about any strategy on whether or not it's going to make money in a given month, right? I hope I'm get, stretching your thinking. I'm trying to be a little bit provocative because there's a lot of misinformation out there on the web and a lot of super smart people uh, supposedly teaching people how to trade and um, – you know, they're sharing a lot of information, but I'm not sure it's always correct. And more importantly, I'm not sure it's always vetted in the realities of trading day in and day out. Something I've done for a long, long time. I know Dan introduced me as the CEO of InvestorQuant. I'll tell you more about that at the very end for about one minute at the end of this webinar. Uh, but I am first and foremost and introduce myself to people as a trader. So here's the only part of my resume that should matter to you, and that is have I actually been successful taking the concepts I'm going to be teaching you and made money with them? That answer is yes. This is going back for every single trade. TradeStation is my um, active investing or trading brokerage, if you will. This is every single trade from all of my accounts. I have several accounts. They all have different goals and objectives. Uh, the bulk of my trading has been around the opening gap. I don't know the exact number, but I'd guess about 80% of all these trades were opening gap trades. Um, hold on, somebody says, no info on screen except title of talk. Can you all see my screen? Anyone? Okay, good. Someone was having troubles there. So um, this is every single trade over 2,000 that I've taken since I started teaching. I showed you my trades before that. It was actually, I had some even better years, quite frankly. It's a little bit easier to... to to trade without uh, being transparent on every single element of what you're 
what you're doing. So when I started teaching, September 1, 2007, I started a blog called Master the Gap, posted my rules, and I posted my exact trade entry, target, and stop about five or ten minutes prior to the open and always prior to my execution, um, prior to the open. And that's how, quite frankly, I built a huge following. Uh, very quickly, people started seeing I was a real deal, and they started trading my my rules, and uh, I just sort of took off from there. So um, I'm, I'm a big believer in transparency, and um, just wanted to get your attention here. Now, I'm not about to stand here and say I'm the best gap trader you've ever met or heard, or the best that you'll ever hear, or anything like that. Uh, I'm trying to be the best I can be. However, uh, there are plenty of traders, I'm sure, that have done better than this. But what I do, do take pride in, and that is very important to me personally, and that has been one of my um, goals, is to be consistently profitable year in and year out. I think there's one year in here, um, if, on the left again, this is organized by date, um, that did not make money. But I've never had, and it was like only down a few percent, I've never had big giant losing years. In fact, one thing I'll point out to you, uh, the far left here, this first group of trades, Again, I did not cherry pick this. I started a blog um, September 1st, and I had a good 2007. It did this sort of take off when the markets turned down, but that's the point I want to make here. During higher volatility situations, like started in October of 2007 and the crash of the markets in 2008, it's a tremendous time to be trading the opening gap and intraday strategies. So that's really what you're seeing here. That's what that's representative of. I hope it can, continues, and that's what we're starting right now. But even during the raging bull market, I did it right. Okay, basics of gap trading. We're opening in just a few minutes. Uh, we'll come back to this, but I want to at least make sure you understand what I'm talking about. A gap is the difference between the opening price of one day and its prior day closing price. So today's opening price, and I use 9.30 a.m. Eastern time when the New York Stock Exchange opens. Even though I'm trading futures and they're trading right now, I'm using that as my benchmark for today's opening price. So wherever it opens relative to where it closed, and that space shows up visually on a chart as a gap. So this is an example. This day opened at 2080.5, sold off a little bit. This is a five minute chart, S&P futures rallied in around 11 o'clock Eastern time, about an hour and a half after the open, it got back to the blue line, which is the prior day close, thereby retracing and quote unquote, filling the gap. So my technique, I'm not a follow the gap or go with the gap kind of guy. A lot of people trade the gaps on individual stocks. They use breakout strategies, momentum stocks, so on. No, nothing wrong whatsoever with that. I just found I prefer to trade the indices because they have a mean reverting bias uh, that's very predictable and measurable. They're more liquid, and I don't have to search around and try to find the optimal stock to trade. Uh, so I tend to trade just the indices, NASDAQ, Russell, S&P primarily. Um, keep an eye on the Dow. Uh, enter at 9.30 a.m. I'm actually entering with a market order. Target the prior close, 4 or 4.15. I use 4.15. Uh, the last trade has a 4.15 Eastern time. And if neither target nor stop is hit, I close uh, the trade. Uh, my targets and stops, I'll get into the exact details on those in a moment. But again, make sure everyone's understanding. Here's an example of a down gap. Big down gap. Blue line was a prior close. Gap down, sold off, worked its way up, filled the gap for um, a winning trade. And, and by the way, I don't know if these, this is a hypothetical screen or real trades. Um, I'm thinking this is hypothetical, just to be clear, um, for sake of demonstration. Here's another day we had an uh, up gap, retraced and sold within three or four or five minute bars. That's called a gap fill. So you're fading the gap, shorting an up gap or buying a down gap when it meets your criteria. We're about to open. Why it works. Geopolitical news and events cause the markets to move overnight on lighter volume. 90% of the gaps are large enough to trade. 70% will fill the same day. Takes advantage of a uh, new driven buyer. So let me show you. I am uh, in the market of short. And let me switch over here and show that to you. We can come back to this if you have questions. Bottom line is it shows 68% of all gaps fill the same day they're created. And that's the uh, table for the past 10 years. So almost got there. Let's get to the charts. Okay, so this is the Globex chart. This is the overnight action. Sold off, worked its way up in the S&P, 
that's this chart here. Russell sold off, worked its way up. They're all fairly correlated. We're opening above the blue line. Blue line's a prior day close. So gaps up, gaps up, gaps up, and gaps up across the board. That's my overnight trading chart. Let's get to my uh, live trading chart. And this is a tracking account. It takes every signal. Um, this, uh, I have taken my rules and created simple automated strategies that trade them. So uh, you can actually see over here, a little bit hard to see. I reckon, let me expand this. But I am short the NASDAQ right now. I was stopped out yesterday. It was the only signal I had fired. The bulk of my signals for today said today was too risky to fade. So I want to be clear. I have no discretionary trades for me. Um, I've got um, seven signals that did not trade today's gaps. So what I've done is I've taken a number of rules, applied it to my data, which I'll show you, and that's one way I allocate capital. But yesterday it went long, and I told all of our members that it was probably going to get stopped out because we only had one signal. But I met my criteria, and I was indeed stopped out in the NASDAQ for about a $500 loss on that contract. I am short the NASDAQ now around that 42.10 42 level. Price is uh, target is the prior day's close, the blue line right there. If you're not seeing my charts, by the way, please do speak up. Hold on, I'm seeing that my questions aren't scrolling. Okay. Um, so I'm short. We'll see if it becomes a winner or a loss. Um, all right, let me get over to another chart. And you'll see the ES have signals in the ES did not fire. And we have signals in the Russell did not fire today. Uh, the data was just slightly different across the board. You can probably see it best on a uh, daily chart here a little bit. I know these are a little bit tough to see. Uh, the, the small blip, small blip, small blip, that's the day's price on a daily chart relative to the three-day action. So it's been interesting. We've had some unfilled up gaps, unfilled down gap yesterday. Let me just point that out to you. So the open of yesterday, in fact, let me expand because I want to make sure you understand exactly what these gaps are and how I define them. We open here today. You see the price action. It's inside the body of yesterday's red candlestick. So we closed right here at the bottom of the red candlestick. We've gapped up and may work our way down to the prior close. At least we hope. Decent chance, actually. The momentum has been really strong to the downside. I was sort of hoping I'd have a little bit more exposure today. I didn't. Again, I have no idea if it's going to work or not. But... From here to here, yesterday's close is um, creates that unfilled space. So this is a big unfilled down gap yesterday, and now we're the day after. We'll see if it goes up or goes down. Uh, over here, you see the unfilled up gap. That was the open there. Well, the open compared to the prior day close over here on the 28th, that was the unfilled up gap. So we had unfilled up gap, small gap, whoops, small gap down that closed about the same price, maybe a little bit higher than big gap down yesterday. So time will tell. Uh, the stop, let me get over. My stop is 30% of the five-day uh, average true range. 30%, I'll show it to you um, on my dumb if I can. Actually, I tell you what, let me get to stop because of stops is actually the next part of my slides. Um, and I'll get and I'll come back to my data and show you the exact stop. In fact, let me just look at it real quickly and I'll tell you, answer for you, so you'll know. It'll show up if it starts. Um, the way the trade station works, it shows you your target if you're close to that. Uh, if you're close to your stop, then it'll switch and show my stop. So right now, um, let me get to invest a quant. In fact, let's just break it down. I'll come back to the charts. The charts are not nearly as much fun as um, the data. Oops, I got logged out here. Bear with me. Yes, that trade is initiated at 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time with a market order. 
not a limit order, nothing tricky, nothing cute. A lot of people spend too much time and they mess around and miss their entries on great trades. I would much rather get an inferior entry on a great setup. And I'm not saying this is a great setup. Again, I have a number of automated rule sets now that I've, frankly, I've, I've just started to trade them in an automated fashion um, for the over the past month for years. All those trades I showed you in that chart manually executed. Well, not all of them, but uh, the vast majority of them manually executed. Uh, so here's why. Well, let me just look at the the Nasdaq data here. So this particular setup, I'm looking at the gap, and again, I'm not going to go in and explain this because you can learn all about InvestorQuant next week if you want. This is not a demonstration. I just want to show you some, uh, show you why this trigger took, or, or why this um, gap was traded today, and it's right here. So um, see the zone data, 68% historical win rate, 2.3 profit factor. Uh, that means it's made more than two times as much in profits as losses. So there was some strong data uh, in play here. You can see the different sample sizes here. So I have three different considerations. It's all automated. Neutral market conditions for this particular uh, zone, opening zone. You can see the price levels anywhere between 42.59 and 41.91. But the three-day pattern was really strong. 39 trades, 85% win rate targeting gap fill. And you can see the um, stop. It's 31 points in the NASDAQ today. Target uh, was at 41.91. So that's about $600, right? $20 a point. And the seasonality neutral. So it met my criteria and it took the trade. Now, um, let me get back to stops in general. A question on the books. To get, a, um, to get the ebook and the slides, go to the link right here. InvestorQuiet.com forward slash winvesting. InvestorQuiet.com forward slash winvesting. And you can download everything immediately. Frank. Uh, has all updated tables also, which I don't know if I mentioned that. Okay, let's, so we'll come back to, um, let me just check, check charts real quickly. All right, um, so far it's working. It's got a ways to go. It's not a winner till it's in the banks. I really don't care. Anything can and will happen today in that regard. All right. Look at the charts overall. Plus, maybe we'll get lucky. Actually, I don't believe in luck. Um, it met the criteria of my rule sets. These rule sets that are working on the NASDAQ and all these markets have been vetted. They are market adapting. They're based on current market conditions, but based on a wide range of considerations I'm going to teach you about right now, and I'll share the raw data with you. All right. Um, it is using a 15-point uh, stop, as I just showed. Um, if it flipped, if it did happen, if it, and it could because it's not you know, filled yet, if it reverses, and runs up, you'll see the stop will show up right there. It's 15 point something, whatever I just said right off of our site. It's all automated. I do not trail stops. Um, trail stocks generally cost you money. Now that said, on automated strategies, I'm not trailing them. Discretionary trading, I will trade them slowly. Um, and I mean real slowly. So for example, in this type of situation, if this were a discretionary trade, which I did not do one today, um, and it was this close to hitting gap fill. So for me, if it goes more than three-fourths of the way towards my target, I will slowly drag my stops down, my first stopping point being halfway between entry and the open. Also, um, correction, halfway between where the original placement and the open. So I'd, I would have cut my stops to seven or eight points in the NASDAQ. And if it gets within a tick or two, then I'll go ahead and drag it all the way down to entry. But I am found that tight stops just result in you get stopped out. Very common for a gap to come down, almost fill, reverse, hit the open, then roll back over. So those are hard to watch, but I just found uh, my best signals. I tend to work better when I give them more room. Uh, yes, I'm, ready with, I'm, I'm, I'm trading whatever the front month, uh, I think, is the terminology on the futures contract is. The one that's most liquid. Let's do that. Let's say that. Uh, the data I was just showing, yes, was um, uh, Vestacross of Members Only site. 
Uh, I do have some free research, end of day edges. If you go to the Vestal client, you can see end of day data. Uh, that's some seasonality data and so on. So, um, okay. Still working. I haven't made a penny yet. This could reverse and stop me out. Um, it happens. All right, let's talk about stops um, in general because this is not a commercial. This is education. If I can get you to see the world through my eyes and through my research, um, some of you will be interested in learning more about what we do at IQ. And uh, others of you will say, hey, that's awesome information. You'll remember me fondly, hopefully, hopefully and be a better trader, and that's all good. Okay, stop and target placement. Again, if you're just joining us, you get the ebook and the slides at investorquant.com slash win investing. Well, our website is investorquant.com. Go to win, win investing. Win investing will get you the slides um, and ebook. It will actually get you auto-registered for uh, my webinar next week where we'll all be taking you behind the scenes at InvestorQuant. Let's talk um, about trading those. So first off, what's the optimal target? Many of you have probably heard that um, and followed folks and been taught that, hey, um, if you get into a winning gap trade, you want to take profits at the midpoint, right? Um, so you can do that, but you're leaving a ton of money on the table, and this chart proves it. Now, let me connect the dots for you and make sure you're understanding the data. This is showing, this is a back test of the S&P 500 futures. If I ran it on the Spider, it would be almost identical, the Spider ETF. Or if I ran it on a highly correlated um, symbol, like the, any one of the NASDAQ 100, S&P 100 stocks will have. Um, I'm getting order filled in my ear, so I'm not watching the market live. It's underneath the screen here, but um, I'm guessing I may have gotten filled. We'll check just for fun. Yep. So filled on the NASDAQ, and you can see it on my trading dome, for a $360 win or 18 uh, points. One contract, this is what I call my tracking account, where I'm tracking all these different signals in research that we create. I eat my own cooking, as they say. All right, back to the chart. So here's the, here's the deal. 78% of all opening gaps over the past 10 years have reached the midway point of their gap, meaning between the opening price and the prior day's closing price. That's called a half gap fill. Many educators and trainers will teach you, or traders will teach you to target that. Um, to me, that is just a, a total waste of time and effort for a couple reasons. One. Um, the expectancy, long-term expectancy of targeting gap fill with the stop size needed to capture that move. And this, by the way, does not have a stop. This is an end-of-day stop. So it's just a, a raw trade, if you will, not something I recommend. But you're not going to make any money targeting half gap fill. Even though 78% will go halfway towards gap fill. But here's the key metric to understand. Almost all of them, in fact, 85% of them, 87% to be exact, will fill the gap completely on the same day that it was created. So why are you going to take half your position off, cut your profits in half, when you've got almost a 90% chance of doubling your average win, right? Are you with me? That's a really important point. You've got an 85 plus percent chance of doubling the average size of your trade if you're in a winning gap trade that gets halfway towards gap fill. Thank you, David. Yes, um, I'm an interactive person, so I appreciate questions. And um, you can, the, the tougher the better. I don't care. I'll do the best I can to answer them. Um, but it's important. I want to make sure you're with me and understanding. If you're not understanding, try to repeat it one more time, and then we can continue. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I don't have my screen in full presentation mode. Sorry about that. All right, that's better. Uh, question, if there's no gap between close and the open, that is continuation of the close, what do you do? Um, I don't do anything, Vic. Uh, the beautiful thing about trading is unlike um, you know, uh, Las Vegas where you have to ante up uh, to sit at the table to see what your cards may get. Gaps, uh, trading is not like that. right? I don't have to ante up anything. I can sit and observe. If there's no gap um, in a given market, then there's no trade for me. Uh, I will wait, for me personally, I will wait for the 15-minute range to form. That means the first three candlesticks. I'll take the high and the low of the first three five-minute candlesticks. 
it creates a 15 minute range high and a 15 minute range low and then my analysis exact same methodology here looking at lots of core metrics um, modified or not modified but core metrics um, uh, tailored for current market conditions and I'll trade those setups high breakouts high fades low breakouts and low fades gaps are what I prefer they're my bread and butter ranges are awesome and I'm, I've done well with those but gaps are what I primarily focus on for the bulk of my capital at least in, in trading decisions okay so key takeaway don't close out at half gap fill sometimes that'll be the right decision to do the majority of the time it's not it'll cost you money I'm not giving you advice but I sort of am <laughs> right? hopefully my attorney is not listening to me right now uh, that's been my experience and that's what the data suggests by the way I was doing this exact analysis 10 plus years ago and the data was almost identical to what I'm showing you right here in, um, in fact if any of you have the old copy of my original book published in 2008 you can compare the metrics yourself and you'll be surprised they changed very very little about one or two percentage points question is uh, what is the percentage of absolute no fillings just or just false moves um, I'm not sure I understand the question but again this is odds of the, the actual back test was assuming that you shorted an up gap or bought a down gap at the open targeting the prior day's closing price and closed it at the end of the day if the prior day close was not touched so it's just an absolute measure if you will of the odds of a certain percentage of the opening gap being filled now this shows um, especially for small gaps not only will they fill the gap which would be the 100 percent gap fill point you know 100 percent gap size they'll go twice the size of the gap and then some so the other thing you should see is that the degradation in win rates pretty small here right it doesn't fall off a whole lot so a lot of times you get gap fill you're going to get some possibility of continuation. I have no idea if that's going to happen today and frankly I didn't look at it closely um, in my data but it's I've got the data available to investor client that I can pull up if we have time and anyone's interested. But let me continue. Yeah these right uh, this right that study has no stops. Now I'm going to uh, show you stops though but with a different view. So uh, what's the right stop to use when fading the opening gap that means shorting an up gap or buying a down gap if it meets your criteria for doing so and I'm not advocating that you trade every gap I'm just asking generically the hypothetical or the question of what's the optimal stop size if there were such a thing so I've organized it by point and this is points in the ES so basically it's you know each point in the ES is worth about uh, 10 points in the um, spider so two point gap or, or it's just a cents or 20 cents in the spider if you're an ETF trader um, you see the tighter the stop the lower your win rate makes sense right the bigger your stop the bigger your win rate hopefully that's very clear to you which should which may not be clear and may be counterintuitive is that it doesn't matter how much how big of a stop it is that stop directly impacts your win rate but overall profitability which I use profit factor as a metric is um, uh, the ratio of historical profits to historical losses so anything more than one has made money anything less than one has lost money anything around one has been roughly break-even um, this data here uh, does not actually I'm not positive includes commissions or slippage I normally run everything with commissions and slippage included I'm not 100 percent positive um, on this study it won't change in these numbers because we're dealing with huge sample sizes or it won't change them significantly maybe it would be 1.05 with commission slippage bottom line is these these are break even okay that's the key takeaway increase the stop all you want it'll increase your win rate but every time you lose you're losing that much more in a proportional um, in fact as the win rate increases it proportionally decreases uh, your average um, um, or it's just it proportionally increases your average loss right so your win rate goes up so does your average size loss which results in not moving the needle you're not making any more money looking at percent of gap size uh, if you use a stop relative to the size of the gap so what do we have um, seven eight points in the ES today if you used a seven or eight point stop uh, that'd be a hundred percent just like you'd expect a 50 50 kind of um, odds 
or whether it goes up or down first. And this is if you're trading all gaps, which I do not, again, recommend. It's not what I do. But this is a starting point to understand how to think logically about trading gaps. And then another way, which is um, my preferred way of uh, using stops, is a percentage of the five-day average true range. A percentage of the five-day average true range. Um, if you're not familiar with ATR, look it up. It's a well-used volatility measure. just takes the high and low of the prior day, prior five days, averages them up. It is inclusive of any unfilled gaps. So it does go back to that prior close if it was a big unfilled gap. But bottom line is it's generally high and low. Average it up. Take this percentage of it and make that your stop. Again, tighter stops, lower win rates. Uh, bigger stops, bigger win rates. Win-loss ratio changes just like one would expect. Profit factor barely moves. So as I like to say, stop, stops are overrated. you got to have them, right? And that's a little bit tongue-in-cheek to say they're overrated. But uh, there's way too much emphasis. This is a huge mistake that many traders make where they spend way too much time trying to determine what is the optimal placement of my stop today. Now, I will admit I like charts. I have um, key resistance and support levels I pay attention to, but it is icing on the cake. My core decision is almost always um, to use a 30% stop. Sometimes I'll use one a little bit bigger if the data suggests using a bigger one. But the sweet spot for me is around 30% of the five-day average true rate in just about any market I've ever tested. And, and actually, I should back up, 30 to 40%. Depends on how volatile the market is. The Russell does a little bit better, with, for example, with a 40% stop. But again, it doesn't impact your probability. It only impacts your win rate. Um, let me see, uh, questions. Vic, yes, this, uh, these concepts are good for all markets. The commodity markets especially are not going to have as high of rent win rates, though. Um, the markets that do best, and I had to rush through that right before the open, are the indices um, that are real diversified because there's a mean reverting bias. Normally, it may be one sector that got upgraded overnight or one earnings announcement or some component that drives the index to move overnight, but the overall market you know, can't really justify the pricing, so big money pushes it back down, filling the gap. With commodities, however, they're single instrument, uh, they're, they're, um, single instruments, basically, right? Corns, soy, gold, oil, and so on. A significant gap in those could be an indication of a trending type of move. They are more likely to trend. That said, I found the win rates to be about 10% different. So if you take all the numbers I'm showing here, subtract about 10%. That's been my rough measure that I use, um, and I'm just more open-minded. You can trade gaps in commodities. Um, there are definitely some excellent uh, gap setups, but they're also great for range trading uh, or can be in catching trending moves. Um, what if you don't use stops? Uh, the, the numbers I showed before were the numbers in terms of win rate you would use. For futures, I think that's crazy, but you know, if you're trading ETFs or individual stocks, then you're going to have the highest win rates, um, and they're going to be a little bit higher than the numbers shown here. In fact, I did show you about 68% of all opening gaps in the ES for the past 15 years have filled when using an end-of-day stop. Right, yes, I'm trading uh, futures only. Nothing wrong with equities and ETFs. I just love the tax benefits of futures. I love the efficiency of buying and selling, not having to you know, use margin and borrow stocks and so on. Uh, and I like the fact when you have an edge, I believe you need to exploit that edge with the most efficient use of leverage you can. So um, it's, you, know, you can trade notional capital, keep a small amount of capital in your futures account, and you know, while in your mind you're back uh, your backstop is bigger capital in your banking account, so that way you don't have any, a lot of money tied up and you get the tax advantages, and you can use as much leverage as you want. And as you grow your capital, you should be trading it more aggressively. I do not have any statistics on reversal at 10 a.m., Howard. Uh, I've seen stats on that, and yet there's some truth to that, especially during raging bull markets, buying the dips. Um, yes, someone says, I day trade gaps too, but my strategy is trading the direction of gaps, so this is interesting. Do I think fading gaps is a whole lot harder? No, not at all. Um, I, I think it's the opposite way. I just showed you the 70, roughly 70% 70 of all opening gaps will retrace back to the prior day's close that day. So 
when I'm doing what I'm doing is I'm going in the prevalent historical bias to trade the opposite direction, the direction of the gap is um, at least in the morning session right after the open I think is harder to do. But what I will do and many of my clients do as well, uh, we'll fade the gap because we know there's a 7 out of 10 chance it'll make it back to the prior close. And then if the um, if that direction of fading, let's say the gap is up like today and you short it, but you believe the swing bias for the coming for, the, for today and the coming days is still to close higher, then we will reverse it with what I call a fade the fill trade, fade the fill of the gap, um, and get positioned to the long side. So. By now, you're probably scratching your head and say, okay, wait a second, you've shown me nothing that proves I can make money um, with your data, that data that I just showed you, right? It's, where's the money? The profit factors are all around one, and they're basically break even historically. Well, that's intentional. The point is, this is not about your stops for sure. Targets do make a big impact on um, uh, your trades, but even so, if you used a reasonable stop like 30% here, and targeted gap fill, um, you're going to, and traded all the gaps, you wouldn't make any money. So this is a game of selection, truly a game of selection. So how do you, how do I select? And by the way, I, I want to be clear, uh, there are a lot of ways to pick and choose your gaps. These are the ones that I like that make sense to me. Uh, I'm a huge um, proponent of folks uh, owning their own rules and decision criteria, but I also believe what I've done, because I've done ex some pretty exhaustive work over the years, uh, is a good starting point for people. And I tell people all the time to, hey, use my stuff to get you started, and then uh, modify and tweak it to your own liking. You'll stick with those trades and those rules far longer, and you'll um, therefore you'll make more money and be more successful. And I've got plenty of clients that have done exactly that. Uh, sometimes a little bit frustrating, quite frankly. Um, where they'll they'll send me the results. I'm like, holy cow, you kicked my butt this year, but uh, it's all good. So gap uh, trade selection reminder: you can get a copy of the slides in my ebook, and I get signed up to learn more uh, for a webinar I'm doing next week at the URL on the right there, investorquant.com/windusting. So gap size: number one way that I start looking at a gap is the size of the opening gap. The smaller not only the higher win rate, but actually they've been more profitable historically. In fact, you can see the sweet spot is these gaps between 20 or um, 0.2 and 0.4 percent of the five-day average true range. Really, I think I've got, I, I want to clarify, I think that is typed incorrectly. That is 20 to 40 percent, 20 to 40 percent of the five-day average true range, not 0.2. So sorry about that, right? That doesn't make sense, 0.2. So I shouldn't have added, I should not have included the percentage um, marks, and we've been okay. Uh, Matt, if you're listening, Matt helps me out here at VestaQuant. I need to fix that. Anyhow, 20 to 40% of the five-day average true range. That equates to roughly, um, gosh, today's volatile markets, um, four to ten points, okay, uh, for the opening gap. So you can see the number of trades, you can see the win rate, the smaller the gap, the higher the odds of retracing back to the prior day's close. And what you should also see is once you go beyond 40% of the five day ATR, the profit factor starts falling off, as does the win rate a lot. Look at that, that's a 14% delta. It's a huge difference in profitability. So what that means is a takeaway. If you remember nothing else, this is a good takeaway uh, for today, that if the gap is greater than 40% of the five-day average true range, it is a much riskier gap to fade. It is more likely to be one that won't quite make it to gap fill that may reverse to a partial gap fill and reverse. Maybe it's one of those that goes to the midpoint. A lot of those are just run against you like yesterday, though. So I like to focus on the smaller gaps. Now, I do not have a unilateral rule that I won't trade a larger gap. That's not true at all. I will trade larger ones. But the other criteria have to also be met, right? Because you're rarely going to have a setup where everything lines up perfectly. 
if gap size is the only thing that's not set up and the market conditions are really good, and I'll talk about this in a moment, then absolutely I'll trade larger gaps. Question is, how do you feel about fading the gap on inverse or the triple X leveraged ETFs? Um, I haven't done it personally, Don. Uh, I have quite a few clients that do. Um, that's that's fine. I, I just can't speak to them firsthand. I don't know what I don't know. Um, there's no reason that I know off the top of my head they wouldn't work. Right? You're not having to deal with some of the long-term issues of holding leveraged ETFs. You're just in and out that day, and I think that's an efficient use of um, capital. Gap zone, tougher concept here. Um, I'm going to keep. Um, I'll try not to belabor this too much. If you have questions, you can email me, Scott at investorquant.com. I'll share that later. Uh, but don't worry if this is confusing. Actually, if you've got questions, please read the book first, which again you can download. Um, it explains in great detail what these zones are. But in a nutshell, listen closely, please. In a nutshell, every day in the market, uh, when you use a can 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 be measured in terms of closing up or down. And when using candlesticks, I simply define as a prior day being down if the close is below the open. I consider a day to be an up day if the close was above the open. So two different scenarios. It can only be one or the other. Occasionally you'll have a doji, but they don't tell you anything, so they're not shown here. So um, just sort of ignore those days. For the most part, we'll trade them once in a while, but a little tougher. So if the prior day was down, meaning we had a red candlestick, then you can look at the subsequent day, you know, to the right. I've got the data on the left here, but to the right, based upon where we gap open. So if you gapped open above the prior day high, you can see it was about a 50% historical win rate. And I call that a DH zone. Prior day was down, we opened above the high. If we open between the high and the open, it would be a DHO zone. A little bit better win rate. If you open between the open and the close, 71% historical win rate. If you open down after a red candlestick, but you open inside of the prior day's lows, call that a DCL zone. And I'm sorry for the confusing nomenclature, but it's it's a useful categorization technique that I've used for a decade with great success. And that has almost an 80% historical win rate. Vice versa. So, uh, so uh, let me ask you this. I've done a lot of talking here. I'm going to take a sip of water. What zone did we open in today in the S&P futures and those four indices? What zone did we open in? Please use the nomenclature. I'll take a sip of water. There will be a big prize for the whoever says it first. Nope. So it is. Nope. What zone do we open today? Yes. Uh, Scott, ding, ding, ding. Correct. The DOC zone. So uh, I'm glad I asked the question. Thank you for responding. Uh, this was yesterday's candlestick, was it not? We had a red candlestick. Today we opened up. So this was yesterday's close. So we opened up today, but we were below yesterday's open. Probably would be helpful if I put high, open, close, and low. So we opened below yesterday's um, opening price. That's a DOC zone. It had a 71% broad um, historical win rate. So let me um, get over to the charts, and we'll look at a live chart. Maybe it'll make it easier for you. Ooh, we're getting some weakness here. Okay, so this is a red candlestick, right? A generic red candlestick. It's yesterday's candlestick. See where the open is here? We open between yesterday's opening price, which is the top of the red candle, and above the close of yesterday's candle, right there. Is that clear? So on my little table, you'd look to the left and say that was a DOC zone that I was just showing you, and has a 1% historical win rate. Okay? So that's a little bit confusing. But while we're on it, how about here? Where did this day, that was three days ago, open? See the bottom of the green candlestick around 1920? Here's the prior day's candlestick. So on a relative basis, this open was in which zone? 
I'm going to go back to the candle, I mean to the uh, chart. So now, that hypothetical scenario, which zone did we open in? David is on it. So green candlestick that day, and we opened down below the prior close, but inside the body of the green candlestick. That has a 76% historical um, win rate. Now let me say this. This is, a, uh, this is difficult to understand the first time you see it and hear it, so do not be dismayed. Um, most of my strategies, quite frankly, don't even use zone anymore. I've evolved over the years to focus mostly on gap size. I do have some that use zone. Uh, NASDAQ data was good for the zone today, as I showed you, um, and generated a signal. That was a winner. So they are very useful for categorizing. My book explains it in great detail, lots of examples. And remember, the book is free. All right, so I'm not making a mo I'm not making any money on the book. I'm not trying to make money on the book. I'm just trying to say that if you're confused, don't worry about it. I can explain the book. It's explaining the book well. If you have any questions, I'll check it out. Let me keep moving on. Uh, part of week. A lot of people don't believe in this idea of calendar bias or seasonality, and that's just crazy in my opinion. Uh, the math is just too consistent for too many years. Now, um, I'm not a big believer in micro-analyzing like the intraday, intra-week, I mean, like Tuesday, Wednesdays, or Thursdays, but I do believe there's a lot of value in uh, paying attention to Mondays and Fridays especially. And you see in general, the first two days of the week, Mondays and Tuesdays, are the riskiest days for shorting. Only about 60% of upgaps uh, fill which is down from the 68% overall average. Middle of the week tends to do better for buying down gaps. Now with one caveat, you want to keep in mind, this is looking at all gaps, not considering any market condition or any other filter. So what's been going on the past, the bulk of the past 10 years? Well, about eight years of it, it's been a bull market, a raging bull market, right? So these numbers will ebb and flow as market conditions change. I do expect the longs won't work quite as well for coming weeks, months, possibly years, don't know. Um, and shorts here on Mondays and Tuesdays may do a little bit better. But it's a data point. It's just one of many inputs that I use when I'm selecting trades. And again, I'll short an up gap on Monday in a heartbeat if it's the right size, the right zone, the right market conditions. And I'll get to market conditions in a minute. And I had a comment from Cindy, not all gaps will fill, look at loot. Lulu or filled, uh, they gap up until now was not filled. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's absolutely right, Cindy. The um, individual stocks will do their own thing, right? Especially if it's around earnings or their momentum stock, and they, maybe they're uh, a biotech stock that just passed clinical trials. They're going to do their own thing, and they're not going to correlate with the broader indices on a, um, every single day. Uh, and even then, even when they're correlated well, they may just miss filling the gap or they may go a lot further. So uh, you do want to, uh, that's why uh, if I'm trading those stocks, I don't use this data. I use my data for that speci specific stock. This is the index data I'm showing you today. I do have data on the NASDAQ 100 and the S&P 100, though, uh, all these same stats. All right, so here, so I've given you some ideas. There's other things I look at. Um, it's gap, but primarily it's gap fade, um, I'm sorry, it's gap size, it's gap direction, are we up or down? Is it opening zone? Uh, what zone did it open into? Were there any unique calendar considerations? Is today a Monday or a Friday, for example? Or what about, is it Fed Day or OPEX Day? Or um, first trading day of the month? Those are all important days that tend to have their own calendar biases, um, and so on. So I consider all of that, but if you and that's how I started. And I had tables just like I showed you, and I had spreadsheets galore and laminated um, process, uh, uh, tables that I looked at and did my analysis, and I would score each opening gap. So I'd say uh, X for um, shorting an up gap on a Monday, perhaps. Uh, but then I'd say, hey, but a check mark because today's OPEX Friday. And my analysis showed OPEX Fridays were good for up gaps. And then I'd give it maybe two check marks because it was a raging bull market and up gaps 
are generally very good for shorting, even during raging bull markets, very counterintuitive. So I would score them independently based upon these single snapshots. The problem is those single snapshots don't have context uh, in the form of market conditions. Context is all important. Um, buying a large down gap um, during a raging bear market is generally a high expectancy thing to do. Buying a large down gap during a raging bear market, a market that's selling off hard, is generally a high expectancy, meaning it's long term you'd expect to make significant profits from doing so. Your win rate might, you might get chopped up on win rate a little bit, but you'll make money because your average size win is going to be so much bigger than your average size loss, at least the way I trade them. However, you buy a large down gap during a bull market, uh, a raging bull market, you're going to lose a bunch of money. And that's very counterintuitive. You would think you'd want to buy this big down gap during a raging bull market and get out of the way on the raging bear market. But remember, big money, I didn't really cover this today, but big money doesn't like to pay retail prices. And they tend to push prices back to the prior day's close, even if the reason for the gap is legitimate. Even if it's totally legit, terrible news out of China. They're going to push. They're not going to bail just because the panicky small money retail traders um, and low volume moves overnight result in a 20 point gap down. They're going to jump on board, make money filling that gap all the way back up, shake out the weak hands, then reverse it and slam it down. By the way, that's my interpretation of price action. I don't know for a fact that's exactly what happens, but I'm. I know that I should say I'm not. I don't know for a fact that's why it happens. I know for a fact that does happen, and that's the whole point of the slide here, is that market conditions matter. You cannot generically say I'm not going to trade big gaps, or I'm not. Well, you can, but you shouldn't, in my opinion. Say I'm not going to short up caps on Mondays. Um, it's all about the market environment. Oh, hold on one second. Hey, Matt, I've got till 10:30. Thank you. Sorry. One of my guys in my office here. It's all uh, had to be done in three minutes. Um, but I've got you till 1030 Eastern time. So we have another 18 minutes. Um, so Vic asked the question, is there a reason when you do, you do not take a gap trade? Um, yes. Most of the time I don't take a gap trade because the combination of gap size, gap zone, day of week, special calendar days, and market conditions don't paint a compelling picture for me. So today, I did take it, but it was just a small portion of my capital. Um, it set up overall in a way that was neutral to slightly attractive. I'll show that to you. I actually posted it. I do a morning commentary and I share it with our members, my analysis. Um, and I did that this morning and said that, you know, I thought it was decent, but not clear and compelling enough for me to do discretionary trades. So I passed on it. I'm not trying, as I like to say, I'm not trying to kiss all the pretty girls, if you'll pardon the analogy. I have four daughters, by the way, so don't even want to get any ideas. <laughs> I'm totally against that. Um, but what I'm saying is that this is not a game of catching all the winners. This is a game of making sure that the trades you take have clear and compelling historical expectancy, profit expectancy. And if you do that with discipline and take a long-term view, you can do phenomenal things in the markets, as I showed you with my equity curves at the beginning of, um, of this presentation. So what do I mean by market conditions? Uh, I'm not going to go into these uh, in a lot of detail, nothing to, to hide, but um, th there's the key concept here is not how I calculate trend. The key concept here is that I look at trend, momentum, volatility, overbought, oversold conditions, and seasonality to evaluate the gaps uh, per the criteria I mentioned, gap size, direction, opening zone, and so on. That's the context for my decision. Um, and when they average up in a way so I just literally averaged the historical results for all these considerations, for all these different market conditions, and when they average up to show a clear and compelling historical win rate and profitability, then I'm in it. It's that simple. I don't overthink it. Um, I let my rules analysis guide me. 
So the, a way to think about this, it was sort of like what I was talking about before with a large gap. Generally, I wouldn't trade a large gap, but you will find in certain market states, which can be defined by, you know, trend, you know, where you are relative to recent highs and lows, momentum in a certain direction, volatility, overbought, oversold, certain states show that very large down gaps, well, any down gap is worth buying. Uh, other times you'll say that, hey, stay away from it. You wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. It's all about the market condition. It's all about comparing historically similar scenarios. So here's my secret sauce. Um, it's the process. It's how I select. Uh, but I want to uh, just connect the dots a little bit further for you. Take these core inputs, right, these core considerations, which I've, I've broken down some of them shared with you today, uh, and they're disclosed in my book with updated tables all the way through 2015. Again, you can download it there with the slides. Uh, that's the starting point. But I compare all of these things to similar market conditions. So let's say maybe they've been... Um, in today's zone, today's zone that worked for the NASDAQ was the DOC zone. Prior day was down and we opened between the open and close. Don't worry about the name, but it, it gapped in that zone, right? Well, there's probably been 300 off the top of my head NASDAQ opening gaps, maybe 500 in the past 10 years in that zone, up gaps after a red candlestick. I don't, I'm not looking just at that raw data point, which I showed you was a 71% historical win rate. Today, my data looked at what about gaps in this zone under similar market conditions? And, and I, again, I showed you I use trend, momentum, and so on, but for the sake of simple explanation, imagine, and I do this, I still use them because they're helpful in daily videos. Let's just use moving averages to make my point. 200-day moving average, 10-day moving average. So how have DOC zones done when below the 200-day moving average above the 10-day moving average. We actually closed above the 10-day moving average yesterday. That's a market state. That's a way to think about market state. And I can, what I can tell you, and I don't know the NASDAQ off the top of my head, but if you break down using the 10 and 200-day moving averages above or below the 10-day moving average, above and below the 200-day moving average, that creates four different market states, right? Both of them above, both of them below, one above, one below. Four different market states when you use the 10 and 200 day moving averages. And the opening zone or the different gap sizes or even gap directions or even different days of the week all have uh, significantly different historical win rates and profitability. Not always, but most of the time there's a variance and it's noteworthy. Make sense? So this is a tough concept. It's called ensemble forecasting. It's been around forever. It's a great for predicting human behavior, political elections, um, cells. I mean, it's, it's used everywhere. Lots of analysis. You can look it up. It sounds like a complicated thing. It's really not. It's just taking the average of multiple systems. So what I've, really, what I've done is what we've done is taken these different concepts and created systems with different market conditions around different concepts like sizes and zones. And then uh, just spit out the data each day, and that drives my decision making. Question from Paul is: How do you place your order, your prior, your order prior to market open? As you do not know if yet if your criteria be met. Great question, Paul. Uh, I've manually executed 80% um, of all those trades that I showed you um, at the beginning of this 2000 some trades, at the beginning of my presentation, um, and I use uh, a time. Act, so first off, I've done some of them manually right at the open. Just place the order on my matrix um, or my dome uh, with a pre-established target and stop already in place. It's called an OCO order. One cancels other. So whichever one's hit cancels the other one. Real standard, routine using TradeStation, but Interactive Brokers, Thinkorswim, they all have them as well. Um, what I have evolved to is I do have some systems that trade automatically and they execute the order at 9.29.59. So one second prior to the open, my mechanical systems um, and, or, and signals, I've got um, both, uh, mechanical or automated signals execute the order, 9.29.59, one second before the open. So I'm trying to time it right at the open because all my analysis are based upon assuming I entered at the open, which still you can get a little bit better entry sometimes by delaying or 
but it's still just as good as just about any other technique I've found for entering trades. And I use a market order. So that means there is some slippage sometimes. What's interesting is I've found about half the time the S&P futures, I get no slippage. I get the actual order of the fill. About a fourth of the, not quite a fourth, 20% of the time I'll actually have positive slippage, believe it or not, because there's momentum away from the open. And about 30% of the time I'll have negative slippage, meaning it'll cost me a tick or two. So uh, before I open it up to questions, just real quickly, um, again, I promise you no commercials. I'm not asking for any money today. Um, but real quick, InvestorQuant is a company that uh, used to be Master of the Gap. It evolved at the request of uh, some clients, actually two specifically, challenged me and encouraged me to take my methodology for trading the gap with, multi with this ensemble forecasting technique, multiple models, and apply it to other markets and other setups. And um, I said, well, that's going to take a lot of money. And I'm doing pretty well with my cash and my trading accounts right now. Um, and I asked one of them, I said, would you be willing to invest in something like that? He said, absolutely. Didn't think twice. Um, so long story short, uh, I passed the hat around, asked others, and had a ton of interest from my clients. So I've got over 20 clients that are actually investors in Investiquan. Uh, so I consider it's member-owned. They provide a lot of direct impact uh, input to us. We have hundreds of members that have been using my research and data for more than two years. Uh, I don't know for a fact that's a great number, but I strongly suspect there's very, very few other educating sites out there that have numbers that solid. I don't know that. I just think there's a lot of misinformation out there, and people, and it's really hard to find real edges. And what we do is hard, really hard. In fact, that's why I started InvestorQuant, so people like you would not have to do it, and our clients wouldn't have to do it. Um, so, anyhow, we're a predictive analytics company. We have intraday strategies, overnight strategies, and swing strategies. I am primarily an intraday trader. I do trade the overnight some, and I'm starting to get back into swing trading. Uh, join forces with Rob Hanna's Overnight Edges. You may have heard of Rob. He is exceptional swing and overnight trader. So we've got some awesome content and research. And uh, we actually have Duke University has been uh, validating um, Duke University Center for Quantitative Modeling. Their um, management school program has uh, been validating and has validated all my gap research for creating a real edge, especially during volatile and bearish markets. And if you haven't done so yet, download my free book. You can learn a lot more about all the concepts I've shared here. Uh, you can download a copy of these awesome slides. Um, and you can um, auto – you'll be auto-registered for my webinar next Thursday. You don't have to do anything. Um, you'll get a couple of email reminders notifying you that uh, my webinar, Trading and Profit with IQ's Intraday Edges, is happening next Thursday. It's actually at noon uh, Eastern time. Uh, it will be recorded, so um, I hope you can make it. If you are anxious to get started uh, and want to um, start learning now and start a trial, you can certainly do that. Shoot me an email, or if you have questions, just shoot me an email and I'll help you out. We will uh, most likely be offering some type of an offer or an incentive to sign up next Thursday um, if interested, but if you're ready to get started now, shoot me an email and uh, I'll try to help you out. Uh, with that, I have uh, about seven or eight more minutes for questions, so uh, fire away. I'll answer anything and everything. And while you post your questions, I'm going to go back and take a peek at the markets. Interesting. We've got continued weakness here, and bulls cannot shake off the bears. Let me get over to a five-minute chart. Now here's a scenario where end of day analysis um, could have helped you out. Our swing analysis, and so a lot of our members will take our end of day studies and swing studies and say, hey, we weren't set up in a bullish manner at all. They were neutral to weak, and they will ride these winners. They will hold them for points beyond just gap fill. I don't have any of those types of signals automated yet. I just have simple signals for trading the gap and um, range. Matt, I've got about 10 total gap trading systems among different accounts. They're all related to the exact same concepts I've shared today. They're just variations. Um, I used to have 
sort of put all my capital into one system, and I found I do better spreading the capital around different systems, with, even though they're all similar and correlated to a degree. Uh, I spread the capital around different markets, ES, Russell, and NASDAQ, and um, slightly different uh, target stops. I use time stops, for example, that helps smooth the equity curve. Oh, thank you, Vic. Glad you got uh, some value out of it. Uh, thanks, uh, Ahmad. Scott says, how long should I expect to take to begin making money with your system? Do you offer other data beyond gap fading? What about range trades? Yes. Yeah, so, um, First and foremost, how long it takes you to be successful is totally up to you. Uh, part of it is dependent upon the, you know, what the market's doing because I will tell you, uh, historically I have been rock solid with averaging uh, two out of three trades are winners. Uh, that means one out of three are losers. We go through drawdowns. If you go back to my original chart and count up all the little spikes down, all the little moves down, you'll see I've endured, depending upon how you want to measure them, 10 to 20 drawdowns. That's um, a period where I'm under um, my prior equity high. And those generally last weeks. Sometimes they can last months. So um, there's no idea, I have no idea how long it takes. That's why I encourage everyone to take a long-term view. But to learn how to use this data, most people find they can get up and running in a matter of weeks. We'll hold your hand. We're motivated to do that. And um, you can, if you subscribe to Intraday Edges, we've got range available, 15-minute and 60-minute range trades. And um, we've got uh, swing trades and of our swing subscription and overnight subscription as well. Oh, you're welcome, Frank. Uh, we don't have bonds or currencies, uh, Aubrey, not yet, but uh, we're certainly looking into that. We get a lot of requests for it. Yeah, and I'll, I'll show you the members uh, for today. In fact, I'll, we'll check out, let's check out the data on um, uh, these magenta lines here are 15 minute lows. 15 minute low is that magenta line on the bottom. So that's the bottom of the, the lowest point of the three candlesticks. I'll show you my 15 minute range guys today. I don't believe I had any triggers. I don't see anything um, on my charts, but we'll double check. Go to my data. And if you check out, all it does change the setup. So this is, I'm logged in with my admin view. So pardon the stuff up top. Um, let me just see something here. Oh, that's interesting. So uh, this is the end of day data. This is free on our website. You can check this out now. Go to investquant.com. Use end of day edges for free. 52% chance of closing above the open today. But you can see two out of the three systems were pointing were bearish. So I'd favor to move to the downside more, a little bit more. I'd call it mostly neutral, but that's what it was showing. Today on the 15-minute ranges, this is members only now. The subscriptions, intraday, overnight swing. And uh, let me refresh that. And that came out at 9.45 Eastern Time. And you can see it had multiple systems. So the bottom side was just dead neutral today. So again, anything can happen on a given day, but under historically similar scenarios, these are def different systems that evaluated the low fade and the low breakout, almost dead even. Very rare to see that actually. So that's what it was for today. Uh, special studies, we look at unique patterns and things. So low breakout just had some cross currents, nothing real clear. One, uh, this did not favor low breakout down day after a down straddle. These are unique patterns. I don't want to confuse you, but uh, that, that is all included and available uh, there for you. And again, I'm not trying to catch all the winning trades. Uh, oh, here's my morning commentary that I posted. Markets appear poised to open a smaller sharp gaps today in most indices, considering the recent bearishness these gaps are tempting for a discretionary gap fade. But the bulk of the IQ edges data is only neutral to slightly attractive. And though these may feel the setup is not clear and compelling enough for me. Now let me um and so it looks like I have one automated gap fade signal. One thing I forgot to mention, I'll go into this next week, uh, but for you stock traders, go to intraday 
it's called uh, radar and helps you identify the best setups occurring right now. So let's look at the low breakout, which appear to have been working well. 15 minute range. Choose low breakout. And there you go. You can check these out right now and see if any of these would have money today. All of them have win rates greater than 60% and profit factors. Um, 1.3 is the profit factor I like to use to stay out of the noise. And you can see all of these. Odds are most of these have done well today and you would have been triggered in the right direction based on today's data. Hey Gordon, if I knew how to boot, beat you, uh, boot you out of the room, I would. <sighs> One day we will beat Navy again. One day. It's been a brutal 14 years, I would tell you that. And this year we had our chances, didn't we? Uh, let me get to a couple other questions. Um, I uh, currently automate trading systems. I currently automate trading systems like your data. Is there any way I can get the data in the form of a raw form, something that could be coded into a rules-based system? Um, yes, yeah, Spencer, we um, uh, we do have we haven't made a big deal out of it. We're in the process of rolling out um, API. We've got an API that's been been beta tested by uh, a number of long-term members for a while. Uh, but that's exactly the whole idea. Can you use options? Yes, certainly for our swing trading service, uh, you can use options. Intraday trading, we've got a number of folks that do that as well. Um, I think the only challenge you'll have intraday trading is um, with options will be for those smaller um, gaps. But like today where the gap was bigger, that'd be a problem whatsoever. Um, in swing trading, and there's some data there. Uh, this is, has a three-day focus, so these are really ideal for options traders. This is called a swing edges. They're actually our least expensive service, but um, if you're interested, you know, because part-timers use this. Our intraday traders are really more full-time traders. Folks, my time is about up, and I don't want to step on anyone's uh, toes. I'm happy to answer any and all questions. Let me put the slide up one more time, and we'll wrap it up. Um, you can uh, join us next week. I uh, do that by downloading the book and the slides, or if you got questions, email me, scott at investorquant.com. Happy to help you out. John, last question here. John says, does the per that percentage hold for all markets? Um, which percentage were you referring to, John? Um, gap fills. Uh, on equity-based indices, yes, I've tested DAX, FTSE, uh, U.S. indices. S&P, Dow, NASDAQ, Russell, they all fill in any given year between 60 and 74 uh, percent. Historically, on average, 68 percent for a given equity-based, broad-based index. If you're talking commodities, you need to subtract that subtract about 10 percent. The majority of those will fill on the day they're created also, but not quite as high of a win rate. All right, folks, I appreciate uh, your time and um, interest, and um, hope to see you again next week. Take care.